Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the inaugural and launch meeting of Media Workers CV19 Crisis Group. The group has been set up with the aim of speaking truth to power in the age of pandemics, in the age of the coronavirus. Um, I think we've all got something to say about the media coverage to date. And we have some great guest speakers who will be talking about exactly that and also how we move forward in the defense of journalism and quality journalism. Um, we've heard much about the Darwinian moment facing the industry, which sounds very uh, apocalyptic, but also sounds very deterministic as if it's an inevitability and it's a tsunami that we can do nothing about. But we're here hopefully to show that actually journalists and media professionals can do something about it. Um, so, I think the, uh, a theme, a dominant theme that's developed over the past uh, few weeks has been the issue of the um, black and minority ethnic workers who have been dying at a massively disproportionate rate, um, which is highly disturbing, and how that crosses over with the question of social class and how working class people and those on the front line have been dying at a massively disproportionate rate. So our first speaker um, is going to be Jean, Jean sorry, Pond Laplana, who is a nurse in Sheffield. Um, and after uh, Jean has spoken, we'll be hearing from Julia Armstrong, who is a local journalist in Sheffield. She's also the chair of the National Union, Union of Journalists South Yorkshire branch. Um, we'll be hearing from Granville Williams, who's the uh, editor of Media North and also from the Campaign for Press and Broadcasting Freedom. And also we'll be hearing from Jack Schenker, who I think I can describe as an award-winning uh, journalist who's written a very fine book on the, uh, the Egyptian revolution. Um, and he has a new book out, which new which came out end of last year, I believe. Is that right, um, Jack? Um, now we have your attention, I believe it's called. So, um, First, let's start with um, uh, on well, us and uh, on, on us. Go on. Go on. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. 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 Well, as you can see by my accent, uh, this is not a Yorkshire accent. Um, I came from Spain 20 years ago. And that's because I came to England, because at that time, it, it, it was a very open society. That's what affected me. You know, I was growing up with the Beatles, the of the Beatles. Uh, my favorite series uh, were the uh, Faulty Towers, the Black Hazard, the Young Ones. I mean, always attracted the multiculturalism, multiculturalism of Great Britain. And when I did not have a job in Spain, I never doubted what I wanted to be. And I came to join the NHS. The NHS is the most multicultural organization in the world. It's over 200 nationalities working alongside and we never had any problem. All we live happily, except in the last 10 years, the media have played a big part of feeling us unwelcome. Um, headline after headline, we've been blamed for doing the NHS down. We've been blamed for stealing jobs. We've been blamed because you cannot have an appointment on the TV. But nobody was telling that without migrants, the NHS would have not exist. 70 years ago, you know, the, um, the uh, Windows generation came uh, to form the NHS. In the last 10 years, it's been Europeans who have managed to, to make sure we close the workforce gap. And during the coronavirus crisis, I also, I can, I seen a lot of journalism not doing what they should do. Journalism should investigate what they say is true or not. Not just print in the front line, whatever the government say. Like today, you know, there was a headline the BBC will not use the uh, Nightingale Hospital anymore, will use the rest of the hospital in the country. Nobody has asked NHS in England how many patients have been in and out of anything. That's why I ask on the time of, of the coronavirus, journalism should be more important than ever. Should make, you know, to investigate whatever the spin coming from the government is true or false. If it's raining, I don't want uh, a journalist to put it raining. I want them to investigate to see if I'm telling the truth or not. If I'm not, I want them to make me accountable. And I do find that a lot of the time, newspapers, just to sell papers, they use us, migrants, as scapegoats. 
And importantly, it's happened again now with the with the PPE saga, that um, the government have decided to have their own guidelines and downgrade the, the World Health Organization's advice. And they have even basically plastic aprons and a face mask that you not use, the only use could use is to sell ice creams. And most of the, um, of, uh, like the, the BAD population have died, most of them, because they're the ones in the front line. They're the ones also who uh, um, have been suffering uh, for a long time of, of having the lower paid jobs. And now it's highlighted the problem that we have with the BME. BME is not that they have um, uh, genes that they're more prone uh, to have coronavirus. It's that the problem is they're exposed to the coronavirus more often because what they have uh, are the ones who nobody wants. And that's what I was asking also, not just with the headlines, the more BME are, are, are dying. I want them to investigate why is that and put some problems. And one, I, I love the clapping of everybody clapping every, every, you know, every Thursday. And, and I love that from the last three weeks, I gone from being a, a low skill worker to a key worker. But I want this language that has changed to carry on after the coronavirus. I want to be part of the society. We are part of the society. We're not second class citizens. And we need to know why of my colleagues are dying more than not the, the rest of the, of, the, of the care workers. And I think that's my three minutes um, that I wanted to say today. Thank you very much, Joanne. Am I on, Phil? Yes. Thank you very much, Joanne, for your uh, three minutes. And um, I'll move on to our next speaker. By the way, after all the, we've heard from all the speakers, we'll all speak for about five minutes. We'll take a round of questions, take maybe three questions, and then we'll do uh, go back to the speakers, and then we'll take another round. And hopefully that'll get us to um, an hour. So, um, Julia Armstrong from Sheffield, a local journalist. Hi, yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I work for the um, Sheffield Star, Sheffield Telegraph, Associated Papers. And, uh, you know, the reason I wanted to come on here was to talk about that how our industry has been really hit so hard by coronavirus and the lockdown. Um, and uh, I think there's something that people aren't really aware of as much as uh, what's happening in other industries. And I think we need to let people know. Um, and uh, lots of freelancers and casuals have lost all their income as companies have been cutting their budgets um, so that they've, they've got no income coming in at all. Uh, they're having to negotiate the, the government, uh, you know, the, the government offers of, of, uh, of, of uh, help, uh, which is obviously very stressful. And, uh, you know, in newspaper groups like mine, I work for, as I say, I told you the company I work for, uh, which owns those newspapers, is called JPI Media, it used to be Johnston Press, it's a Scottish owned company, which has got hundreds of titles across uh, most of Britain and, and uh, part of Ireland. And uh, the company on April the 1st decided to uh, Get in touch with us all and tell us this was happening that we would that we were facing what we were facing and to be honest we all thought it is this a joke is it a scam when we got this uh, message through to say uh to say what was happening and of course it wasn't unfortunately so what they've done is they've put um they've put quite a lot of uh, workers in the company on to furlough including about 10 percent of the journalists i would say and also um we've all had pay cuts everybody in the company's had pay cuts and um, the any pay rises that would have that would have appeared during the next three months have, have been uh, cut, and also they've uh, they've got rid of a lot of um, free titles, free newspapers have all been stopped publishing, and that leaves some communities without any uh, news organisation representing them, uh, for instance, in quite small uh, areas of Scotland. You know, and this is all uh, bad news, and it's not just journalists. It's hits, obviously. It's uh, you know, there's all sorts of people work for the company, and um, you know, it, it's caused a lot of a lot of people are not amazingly well paid, and it's caused a lot of hardship. If you're in a house where there's more than one of you, um, you know, one, more than one late wage earner that's facing this, you know, there's been a lot of worry. And obviously, the other thing is that um, people are worried that if they've been put on furlough, they'll be first in line for any redundancies that might come up. 
and uh, you know we've seen a lot of redundancies hit the industry in our company so that's not a bad bet really unfortunately and with, as a union we've sought to get uh, reassurances on some of these issues and you know the companies talk to us about it but we were bounced straight into this there was no chance to have any negotiations with the NUJ which is the the uh, union that represents journalists and that that's a that, that's a, a pattern that's been across all the major newspaper companies uh, in in Britain and the major provincial newspaper groups a lot of the national papers ITNs had uh, furloughs um, magazine companies etc etc um, and the other thing is that the BBC uh, actually was is not hit by it because of its funding, but uh, has had to suspend 450 job losses it was making in order to cope because we're busier than ever. And the reason that we are losing um, money and, we're, and that, that mm -hmm. there's all these cuts going on is because um, is, is, is because there's a uh, there's a problem with advertising basically uh, the advertisers by and large have decided that they're either not advertising at all because they're making cuts or if they are advertising they've decided that coronavirus is a toxic issue and um, it, and it's a toxic issue um, and it means that these days there's a lot of um, online uh, online journalism is what companies are, are really keen on and uh, you can use, you know, uh, you can use algorithms in order to, to to look at what's in a story and the metadata, you know, what you what you put on the story to say uh, where it should go, uh, you know, what, what issues are involved with it. We've been told by our bosses not to put coronavirus on if we can avoid it, because that's what the, uh, the, the algorithms, the computer algorithms from the advertisers are picking up. And it means that they don't have to advertise that uh, they, they can decide not to rather advertise on those stories and obviously those stories are the ones that are most interesting to people everybody is just really that's what they're obsessed with obviously and it's been uh you know it's been encouraging to see that uh, that uh, for, for, for a change journalism has been better regarded uh that uh, you know we're, we're because we're a more trusted source of information and uh, and whatever and distraction as well that we're being that we're being, uh, you know, that, that, we're, that we're more popular than ever, but at the same time, the companies are saying, we're not making the money, therefore we're pulling the plug on, on, on a lot of it. And uh, we've got editors pleading with uh, readers to, to, to uh, help fund journalism. Uh, and it feels like a very uncertain future ahead for us all. I was pleased to see my union, the National Union of Journalists, talking about the future for the industry in general and plans for how we could fund it better and get away from this sort of thing. But, there's a gap there. The trouble is that that's talking about the future. In now, in the here and now, we're losing jobs, we're losing money. And I feel like the NUJ needs to be looking at how it's going to get that message out to people at least. And if it, ideally lead a fight and, uh, and, and try and save journalism, because I think it is important. So um, thanks, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Hopefully people are aware of the uh, National Union of Journalists recovery plan. It's got a little bit of press coverage, but the key question is actually how we get the recovery plan into operation, which requires journalists and media professionals to start speaking up in a big way. Um, okay, our next speaker is Granville Williams, who's the editor of Media North, and which is part of the Campaign for Press and Broadcasting Freedom. Over to you, Granville. Thanks very much. Um, I want to, first of all, endorse a, a lot of the points that Julia's made. I live in Yorkshire too. Julia in South Yorkshire, I live in West Yorkshire. I'm a member of Leeds and Wakefield NUJ branch. And we hear online, we have our meetings and we hear about the devastation that's been caused. And of course, it's because already what I consider to be a public good. Newspapers are a public good. And the crisis has demonstrated that enormously. Um, people want to read about local news information. I have a local newspaper shop. When the local newspaper comes out, it's taken. People read it. The trouble is that for many years, there's been a spiral of decline. And what the COVID crisis has done has accelerated that enormously. So there is a crisis. And I do think that the NUJ recovery plan that you refer to, Gary, is very important. 
because it outlines the ways in which, and this is the problem, the government should intervene to actually support a public good, news and reliable information being disseminated to people. So I'm, I'm certainly supporting very strongly the any initiative to ensure that local and regional newspapers are, are given the wherewithal to survive and to do the job that they're doing under great pressure. The other point I want to make though, and it's it goes back to the your introduction, Gary. What we're seeing with the COVID crisis, and it's not been reflected in the media enough, is that there are massive divisions so that we had this spectacle of Boris Johnson, you know, this struggle to survive as if it's all we're all equal. M most of the people who have been affected and dying from this pandemic, it's a class issue. And indeed, it's as you've in in indicated, we are seeing in the health service, the number of ca casualties from the black and minority ethnic community. So this doesn't get reflected adequately in our media. I want to give you an example of what happens when you try and get these points across. Now, a week ago, Panorama put out the program on the major failure, the major failure by the government to actually plan and pr provide protective equipment. It put the program out. And what did we see? Sections of the media, instead of supporting a, the important information that the program was putting out, attacked it. The Mail and the Telegraph attacked it. Tory MPs attacked it. And of course, as well, the culture secretaries now rode in and complained to the uh, Tony Hall, the general secretary, uh, the chief executive of the BBC. So I, I really do worry that we, in terms of the flow of information that we are getting from our national media, it's very, it's very uncritical. It reflects across the kind of uh, messages which are often just absolutely hollow in terms of their content coming out from the government. And the problem is that, of course, the, 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 this government was very hostile to public service broadcasting, if you remember in the election. Um, they attacked public service broadcasters that were trying to hold them to account. So I think that's going to be a very important issue. There, so the two points I'd like to emphasize, one, the importance of a sustaining and supporting journalism as a public good and getting accurate and balanced information out there. But secondly, we need to hold some of the media to account in their inadequate performance and at the same time praise, and there has been good journalism done, which has highlighted some of the incredible gaps and incompetency demonstrated by this government in the way it's handled the pandemic since February. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Granville. Yeah, can I just to endorse what you said? Um, it goes beyond incompetence to a matter of policy and the policy of herd immunity we heard about at the beginning. Um, and there has been some good journalism done, but sadly, lots of people are just seeing the lobby journalists who have been somewhat supine, I think, uh, in their approach to the government. Indications that might be changing with the Panorama show last week. But over to Jack, who will um, give some introductory words for about five minutes or so. Jack Schenker. Uh, thank you, Gary, and everybody else. Um, really, really interesting contributions so far, and I, and I endorse them thoroughly. Um, and I don't want to retread over similar ground too much, um, but just to say that uh, the things that strike me about our current situation as media workers are kind of fairly obviously that the pandemic is exposing and intensifying existing fault lines, um, particularly those concerning casualization and insecurity within the industry, which is particularly an issue for, for younger journalists such as myself. Um, and then also, as has already been alluded to, the real question of what our media is for 
and whether it's fulfilling its basic kind of democratic and public function, um, both more widely within our within our politics and certainly right now um, under the shadow of, of, of coronavirus. And we already have an industry, as, as we know better than anyone, that is struggling on its own terms um, uh, in terms of being able to turn a profit and prove that it has a sustainable business model, you know, particularly with lots of big media outlets that are still struggling with their kind of digital transition. Uh, we have an industry that's exploiting us, its workforce, and it's failing the public that it's supposed to, to serve. Um, you know, we have a profit-seeking model amid falling revenues that's created this vast uh, journalism mill uh, where many reporters, again, especially younger ones, not for want of ambition or ideas, and there's been some interesting articles about this recently, anonymously by, by media workers, are pressured to pump out clickbait, they rewrite exclusives from rivals, they have to produce inane pieces on anything that's trending on, on social media, they don't have the time or resources to go out and do original uh, reporting. Um, and married to that is is an inherent job insecurity in the form of temporary contracts, a casualization, and increasing freelance and self-employment. And of course, this is increasingly becoming the norm across many, many uh, professional industries. Um, but not only does that make our lives more precarious, uh, but it censors dissent from below because you know, often reporters and other and they, other colleagues don't feel that they have the uh, the confidence to bring up issues of exploitation, to risk trying to unionize their workplaces, and to hold management to account for kind of some of the shoddy journalism that's being that's being produced. And of course, under, of course underlying all of this, as several people have already rightly said, is the fact that our newsrooms are not diverse enough in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of gender. And indeed, you know, they still operate by and large, in terms of our major titles, including some of our major liberal left titles, uh, some of which I, I work for, uh, still operate largely within a certain ideological sort of centrist liberal consensus that's kind of rooted in the third way politics of 15, 20 years ago uh, that does not conform with the political kind of dynamics that we're in today. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the point about the the ways in which um, the ways in which the kind of lobby journalists and some of the more visible uh, kind of figureheads of the media industry have been treating this crisis. I, I tweeted the other day juxtaposing Nick Robinson's um, tweet, which went quite viral a couple of weeks ago when Prince uh, Charles was first diagnosed with coronavirus. And Nick Robinson tweeted, "We're all in it together," and I uh, juxtaposed that with the uh, with the headlines that came out the other day, which show just how devastating this virus has been for the poorest in our in our community, and how death rates and hospitalizations are so uh, tied to economic status, to race, and to all the other markers of marginalization um, in our society. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the only the only other points I kind of I wanted to make are that particularly for younger journalists and particularly for those trying to make their their name they actually find not a lot of solidarity often from their older peers present company excluded I'm talking about the big names with the blue ticks um, on Twitter you know when when the government was first pushing its herd immunity strategy and uh, you know many journalists including including many who work for more independent outlets were asking really important critical questions about it they were being mocked uh, by you know the people who the BBC's political editor, the ITV's political editor, and so on, um, for daring to question uh, the question the government on this. And I think it's little surprise that actually journalists and newspapers right now, according to the latest polling I've seen, are amongst the least trusted sources of information on coronavirus. Um, and just very quickly, because I'm running out of time. In terms of where we go forward from this, I, I've read the NUJ recovery plan. It, it really excited me. I think you know there's a lot of really good stuff in there. I've also I've been to I'm a member of the London freelance branch. There are fantastic people in there. I've been to some of the meetings. I also, as a reporter, cover independent trade unions, uh, uh, renters unions, the kind of forms of political struggle and organisation that have emerged in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And you know. They are a world away from 
relatively sort of the, the kind of stuffy atmosphere of, of, of an NUJ meeting. And I wonder how much we can learn from new forms of, of, of trade union organizing, you know, about how to bring in younger workers into, into the union movement, because it is, it is so necessary uh, right now. Um, and yes, the only other thing I'm, I'm wrapping up right now, and I'm just rapidly reading re re my notes, uh, yeah, do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and just say, yeah, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on how we how we how we organise um, both within the NUJ and beyond it because it's never been it's never been more important. Thank you very much, Jack, for that. And I, and uh, I know there are some people having difficulties getting onto this live broadcast. Um, it's a learning curve, I guess. It's, so apologies to those who are not able to watch this live and will have to watch it at a later date on YouTube or for that matter on Facebook. Um, okay, we have uh, first question in from Celia. Give our speakers a moment to get a pen and pencil. What do we do if big cuts, if there are big cuts at the BBC? Second question. Should the government tax Google to fund the media or would that simply reinforce the status quo? So there's three questions there. Um, I'll take the speakers uh, as we got them. Uh, Julia, uh, Julia, would you like to kick like off? To kick off? Um, Shall I ask? Sorry, Gary, I just I can't remember what the first question was. I'm sorry. I'll oh, go too quick. Um, what yeah. do we do if, uh, if there are big cuts at the BBC? BBC. And what should we do? I would hope that the unions will join together and do something about it. Um, I think the, the problem is a lot of people have unfortunately lost faith in the BBC coverage, BBC News, which is, is an absolute tragedy as far as I'm concerned. And I think probably at least partly it's because of the uh, political, uh, oh yeah, you did. It's, it's at least partly on the, because of the political pressure um, for the from the Tory government um, and and threat, threatening the way that it's been funded. And uh, I think that that's made possibly that's that's had a, a, a big effect on uh, on on the managers in the BBC. And I think we could see that a lot of people were very critical over the coverage of the uh, the last general election, for instance, and. Uh, you know, I, I understand that because it was it was it was horrendous to watch sometimes, and that's that is that's a big problem really. Um, but I do think that uh, that that people are starting to you know the BBC starting to pull back again, especially with the Panama program and things like that. So I feel that you know we have to journalists and uh, other other media workers have to get together and start looking at you know talking about what the positives are about the BBC. And uh, and looking looking to see if we can lead some sort of a fight back, but I've got to say that it's going to be harder than it should be. I think because of, because of the, the problems that have, that have happened, I'm all, I'm all for taxing anybody like Google. I think they should pay tax. I know that they uh, that we've had um, has been fund the various bits of funding to uh, for local democracy reporters. The BBC's had to give some money for that. Um, uh, who, who re report on various council meetings and other uh, public meetings, uh, etc., for, for a range of, of, of media uh, organisations. And uh, there's Facebook reporters, uh, reporters who I suppose they work more with minority communities uh, and, and, uh, and and communities are underrepresented in local papers. Who work for, for organisations like mine now. You know, great, let, let them do it, but at the same time, they need to pay the taxes because they need to pay the taxes. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Julia. And Mr. Joanne, would you like a view from um, beyond the media looking in? Yeah, um, um, beyond the media. Um, I just lately, uh, I just um, looking at the media, there's just the, the new headlines, you know, that our Prime Minister is, um, is like a hero, he's been survived, he's survived coronavirus. Don't forget that um, Boris Johnson was in was intensive care because of his own stupidity. Because he went to visit coronavirus patients beginning of March and give the handshake to them. I mean, the, the narrative that he's a hero, the narrative is being close to death also is not true because I work in intensive care and he was far, far 
for being as poorly as being intubated. I mean, he spent two nights in intensive care. He was poorly, I give you that. But now that there's something that he's a saint and we should go behind him and everything, is he was intensive care because he was late up to, to, to do the, you know, the, the quarantine, late on ProVTP, late in reaction, and spent February going on holiday. I just want to say about some of the newspapers saying that and regrets the tax. Everybody should be taxed. UK should not be a tax haven like it is. And the UK government should follow the initiative from other uh, countries in Europe to uh, not to give any money to any companies who don't pay their taxes in the United Kingdom. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Joanne. Granville, would you like to come in next? Quickly on the BBC. I think, again, we've got to put this in context, what's going on. Um, I'm getting a lot of echo here, by the way. Is it, are you hearing me clearly there? Yeah? Good? Okay. Um, on the BBC, th there were already cuts going to be made. The 450 journalists were going to be uh, let go, suspended, made redundant. And the, the BBC suspended that because of the enormous demands to get out information during the COVID crisis. But you need to put all of this in a context. We have a hard right Tory government. Uh, those sections of the Tory party that were more sympathetic to the BBC, they're out. And so there's a kind of DNA within this hard right government which is deeply suspicious of the BBC. I'm a critical friend of the BBC. It's done some terrible, stupid things. And Julie's referred to the uh, recent election where there was lots and lots of mistakes made. But the point about the BBC is it is a space that's regulated and required to be impartial, unlike our national newspapers. And I think therefore what this government has done and previous Tory governments is seek to demoralize and disintegrate the BBC. And that's why I think, and I, I hope the BBC, when it comes up to a new charter, is a reformed BBC, a more democratic BBC, a more accountable BBC, but I want it to be there reporting. On the other point about Google, what you've got to remember that these big social media giants operate globally. They pour enormous amounts of money into lobbying to prevent accountability. And so these token gestures that Julia referred to, the, the local democracy reporters, I think have made a very important difference to local reporting. Isn't it amazing that these are the same, they're replacing jobs that were cut by the very same media owners. And of course the funding by the BBC and other funding, I think is a, a bit of a paper an elastoplast really over a crack, but it's important. However, I really do think we're reaching a point where there has to be, not just at a national level, but globally an accounting with these very powerful corporations, which have become increasingly dominant, and of course, destroying the fun traditional functioning of our local and regional newspapers by hollowing out advertising and circulation and whatever. So they are big issues. The COVID crisis has highlighted them, but I think they were there underneath subterranean bubbling away anyway. And that's why I think the issues to do with media reform of the BBC and also how we fund national, local, regional newspapers and also alternative media, that's the key thing. We need to ensure that there are new forms of funding to create new voices and new ideas and new perspectives in our media. Because our national newspapers, let's face it, they look tired often and the kind of stuff that's in many of them, it, we, it weeps. During the election, I read for the whole of the general election every day, all of our national and Sunday newspapers. I've still got the scars on my back from reading it. The appalling stuff was in there. We do need media reform in the long term. Thank you, oh, Granville. Thank you, Granville. Jack, would you like to come in? Yeah, thank you. 
I mean, I think I, I agree completely with attacks on the tech giants and that is something that is in the NUJ uh, recovery plan as one of their, their suggested uh, policies kind of, you know, coming out of the, of the pandemic. I think the issue I have with it is that it's in many ways, uh, it's a meaningless demand unless we reframe what journalism is and what it, our relationship is with these kind of digital monopolies. And at the heart of that is surely fighting for the basic principle that journalism is not just another commodity that is left to the ravages of the free market, but is a social good and a public good that deserves to be fought for, deserves to be funded, and plays an essential role in our democracy and in our society. And for that argument to be made, um, especially under the government that we have, uh, we, you know, we have to we have to fundamentally win a political argument that you know not everything including journalism um is is purely to be left to the winds of of you know financialized global capital i mean we've already seen in america uh you know with the pandemic the fact that uh, newspapers or agencies are folding they're being snapped up by hedge funds and other kind of global financial entities that are going to uh, pick over the remains and certainly will not have you know the interest of of public service journalism and local journalism at their at their heart uh, i think in america since the early 2000s newspapers have lost half of all of their uh, staff in terms of local newspapers in Britain, I imagine that, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, those, those cuts have possibly been, been even deeper. Um, and I think that uh, the notion that we are ever going to get, you know, either the, either the tech companies to act uh, kind of munificently from on high towards journalism, or that we can expect this government to take the steps needed to address the situation is, is fanciful. So it all comes back again to, yes, 100% agree on, on tax on the tech giants, but then how do we build public support for that? And that comes back to the question of how do we organize as media workers? I don't have the answer uh, on my own to that question, but I think you know that that's the question we have to answer in order to get to these to these bigger topics such as you know how we get how we get these big tech monopolies to to pay their fair share towards journalism thank you thank you very much jack we have another uh, we have a big round of um more questions so um take some notes speakers first up corbyn was vilified by the media over the magic money tree but johnson found a forest of money trees is BBC and mainstream media always biased? Second question from Mike. How are local journalists connecting with local campaigns? Another from Mike Glover. Are enough journalists asking politicians, care home managers, etc., if a lockdown is working? And finally, from Kate. Should journalists listen to workers or the government and employers when it's safe to return to work? So there's quite a few there. Um, so I start with Jack. I'll let Jack have some a moment to get his thoughts together. Are you okay to go, Jack? Uh, yes. Well, not really, but I'll give it a break. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> Um, I got. I think I've scribbled down most of those questions. Although now looking at my notepad, it's just a kind of incomprehensible. <laughs> we'll see, see how I get on. I mean, just I, well, I'll take the first one first, which is the point about the hypocrisy of Corbyn's um, the coverage of Labour's election plans and manifesto. Um, you know, not just in the run up to the last election campaign, but ever since 2015, um, when Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party. And indeed, uh, you know, the situation we're in now in terms of uh, the state finding vast amounts of money uh, in order to keep the economy going. Also, uh, very controversially, I think, to bail out industries which, unlike journalism, are socially destructive, things like aviation and so on. Um, I don't think anyone on this call is is kind of surprised at that level of hypocrisy it comes back again to the points we've all already been talking about which are about 
who owns the media and in whose interests are the mechanisms of the media run. And the fact is there are fantastic, really, really good independent media outlets with brilliant journalists producing fantastic coverage of this moment and thinking and interrogating politically and economically what it means that we've had this shift in norms from a state that you know and a, and a political party that trumpets its affiliation to austerity to one that is seemingly spending money kind of left right and center what are the political possibilities that opens up what are the dangers you know how can we build on that to build towards a better fairer more progressive society there are some people doing that journalism but by and large um you know it, we are more likely in our daily media to see really front pages that would shame a uh, you know a, a completely propagandistic regime some of the co coverage of um boris johnson's hospital stay and the birth of his child uh whilst i completely accept that both of those are newsworthy topics uh you know some of the tabloid front pages genuinely kind of jaw-dropping um in their kind of mindless adulation and i think it's telling that when the Sunday Times expose came out and was rightly um, praised by many people within the industry and lots of people were saying this is a very good day for British journalism. I think they were right, but I think it exposes the very many bad days that had gone beforehand um, and the fact that, uh, you know, by and large, we hadn't seen that kind of reporting in the mainstream media, although we had seen some of it in, in, in those more independent outlets. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, we should certainly call out the hypocrisy in terms of the media's coverage of, uh, of of this government and its actions compared to compared to Labour before. But in many ways, I think again, just to sound like a broken record, it goes back to these original points of you know how do we democratise the media more generally, and that comes back to how we organise. And I'll stop there. Okay, you can always come back later, Jack, on the other ones because I've sort of kind of dropped you in it there a bit. Um, I'll take uh, Joanne next, followed by Julia and then Granville. So, Joanne, so Joanne, I feel that you need yeah, to. Yeah, hiya. Um, for me, um, regarding the co Corbyn, the media coverage in the last few years, it's just not about Corbyn. It's about generally uh, a lot of newspapers are allowed uh, to print lies on the front page with no minimal consequences. The only thing that they, they somebody complain is that three months after they put a little uh, sorry comment on page 27 that nobody sees and that's it the damage is being done and for me we need to have a lot more uh, robust punishment for people for journalists who, do, who lie and put it on the front page if i lie as a nurse i lose my job i have i have a, an oath uh, you know to uh, to the truth and i to do no harm why journalists and some of them can get away you know um um printing basically a lot of them lies without uh, no evidence behind and to have no punishment uh, for, it's quite astonished, astonished and, and for me uh, that's completely wrong because as it was some of the other speakers mentioned now the the people don't trust anymore uh, newspaper and that's uh, for me it's quite a pity because there's a lot of good journalism who, who do research and everything but to do research and, and find the truth takes time. And we live in a society that a lot often we don't have time. We only uh, sell headlines and with not a lot of, uh, of substance behind. And that clear example is the government. It's, they're very good on headlines with no substance behind. Uh, and that's where the society goes. And unfortunately, uh, journalists um, with a bit more rigorous and everything, get, they get uh, on sidelines because that's what not sending paper nowadays. And truth for me should be the one of the big yes of any newspaper. If obviously everybody can make mistakes and everybody can print something that later on the line is, is proved wrong. But when they do it day after day, just because their own objective is to sell newspaper and to make sure that they have the, the support from the government, that's completely wrong. And that should have no place on any media in any country. That's my opinion. Joanne, thank you very much. Julia? Yeah, the main questions are still being left hanging, but um, your turn. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I think it's clear that the media is biased. Uh, I was looking at, um, 
I was I was looking at a report that said that that, that, that uh, describes national newspaper editors etc and managers as male pale and posh the same as the people who, who, who run most countries or every country um you know they're, 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 they've come from the same public schools they have the same views it's not surprising uh, organizations like the Yorkshire Post which is one of the papers of the in the company I um, work for it's um it, it was set up to pursue the aims of the Conservative Party advertising is is what makes money and so what happens is in in this situation um you know they they chase online hits because hits make money for you know it's, it's monetizing what what our content is so we write stuff and it gets hits so therefore a lot of what newspapers and other organ news organizations do is reflect back what's popular now if you're working for a local paper it's really frustrating because you know you write something about a greg's uh, shop bringing out a new sausage roll or shutting for half an hour or something and then we get thousands of hits on that nonsense you know so and that's so our, so our bosses do think oh that's what's popular we'll push that so there is part of that and i do think that um you know that it does come back to funding as, as jack was saying uh but it also comes back to the confidence of journalists and uh in a situation where you look talking at a casualized industry in a lot of cases particularly the national media um you know the national newspapers if you're looking at a situation where you, you're uh, you're under the cost the whole time then shortcuts do happen unfortunately and uh you know speaking truth to power is what we should be doing but we 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 haven't got the we haven't we haven't got the staff to to do it on a consistent basis which is why it's been great to see things like the local democracy reports because they do fill in that some of that gap but they can't just do it on their own so it's a frustration but at the same time we have to have i think as well we have to have strong media unions in order to empower people to do that um mm -hmm. i think that on the issues of uh campaigning i think there's been some great campaigns one particularly in the local media there's been thousands and thousands of pounds raised for various charities and causes and uh media's been involved in getting ppe and visors and all that sort of thing uh for people and i think it's an absolute disgrace that that's not just being provided by government but it's not and so people have been you know so they've been uh, connecting the dots between people who can do it whether it's a uh, people are, uh, whether it's teachers at a local school or 3d mm -hmm. printing organizations etc so they've been doing some of that stuff and obviously just doing part of it sort of to say be safe and you know uh we we need to, we are in it together as ordinary people um and i think there's been a lot of that that's been reflected um on the issue of uh, care homes and his lockdown working i don't think that's personally that's not what if i was a news editor that's not what i'd be asking i'd be asking where is the ppe for care home staff and for and uh, what what training has been done for those staff who are having to cope with an unprecedented situation as we keep saying and um what was the last thing i think i've covered them all now haven't I? oh yeah and return to work i think we need to take uh, you know we we, we need to uh, all be worried about that wherever we work if we're in a workplace with other people we need to i think the neu the teachers union in britain has had a brilliant thing with its five tests campaign and absolutely i'm going to be pushing for my bosses to answer some questions about how safe we can be in our workplaces thank you i'm done thank you julia Granville, up next, and we'll get you unmuted. First of all, with the the money tree, the Corbyn thing, um, because quite clearly um, the whole business about the austerity years, the decade that we've lived through, there was this um, quite ruthless drive to push for cuts so that the very people who are now praising the NHS Rob and all the others, they were the ones who voted against any pay cut for NHS workers and clapped and clapped in Parliament when they won the vote to block any pay increase. So there's a hypocrisy here that I think needs to be exposed as well. That the ways in which the, or the, 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 the magic money tree can suddenly reappear. The other point I'd make about Corbyn um, in the book, I, I, we just published a book, it's called It's the Media Stupid, and there's a wonder, powerful chapter in it by a former BBC journalist, Nick Jones, where he looks at the vilification of Corbyn. And the, the point I would make, you referred, Jack, earlier to the coverage of uh, 
of Boris Johnson and the, his child and his coverage. Boris Johnson, we know, has an appalling record in terms of his journalism. He, he's published lies. He's been a brutal, uh, anybody that's challenged him, he just, just, just gets rid of. And yet, somehow, as the cover of the book shows, he manages to slide above it. And yet Corbyn was vilified and nothing ever stuck with, um, with Johnson. So that's one of the reasons, but holding politicians to account, they didn't do it with Boris. I, I just want to mention one other point very quickly, and this is about listening to workers about how we actually uh, return to work what we do. Of course, we used to have what were called industrial correspondents who had very good contacts and reported on what was going on. I've been following in America, Mike Elk, who runs a payday report. And Mike Elk has done something wonderful. He's got what he calls the COVID strike tracker. And he, he's trusted all around the country in America. And so people tell him, and he's got now 150 accounts of how workers have taken action because their companies are up, work, make, force them to work in unsafe conditions. Now, Mike Elk's payday report, he runs it by appealing to people to fund it. That's how he does it. And it's incredible what he's done because his stories coming out there on payday report have made it into the mainstream media and have been published in a widespread way. So we need to get these different stories out there. There are people with talent and we need to support them to do it. The only other point I'd make is that there's a distinction in my mind, very clear one between the distrust that we have for national newspapers in the main. And I think still there's a general trust for local journalism. And I'm talking here about both local journalism in newspapers and also in local radio, BBC radio. You, can, you see that in the way that all of the polls show that clear difference between the two. And I think it's important to re recognize that difference. A lot of the national newspapers, we know why people distrust them because they're full of uh, disinformation. Joanne, Joanne, Joanne made the point about um, stories that are false. We need a right of reply. We need to be able to say, you've printed that story, it's false. We want a right of reply which is published in exactly the same position in the paper as where the original story reported. Now, at the moment, we've got a useless regulator called Ipso, which will never even consider such an issue. But I really think that the issue of media reform that I've mentioned before is very important. We need to start saying, how do we democratize the media? How do we make it more accountable? How do we make it much more trustworthy? And I think these are key points that will come out of this and other discussions that take place. Thank you. Thank you, Granville. Um, if I could just follow on from that on the um, question of the unpopularity or, uh, of journalists or the, the low repute in which our profession is held. I think there was a survey done by, I think it's the Reuters Institute, but it's in line with many other surveys which puts journalists below politicians in terms of trust of the general public, which is not very good. Um, but I think we need to distinguish between uh, the regular journalists and the people who control the journalism. That's to say that, uh, as Jack has pointed out and others, that these media organisations are not neutral. They are owned by shareholders and they do work in the interests of those shareholders. And that actually infuses what happens in the newsroom. Um, that's why we have to have trade unions that are strong, <laughs> but can actually guard journalism so that we can uh, put the resources into the things that we need to actually cover and actually direct the news to cover the truth and speak truth to power. Um, so, you know, journalists are not entirely free agents. Uh, so it's sometimes it's very often unfair to pick out the journalists when actually they are employed by a boss who tells them what to do. And that's why we need to build strong unions. And actually, but despite all of that, there is still some good journalism done. Um, I know in, um, in Sheffield, the care home, there's been a, an investigation by a local newspaper there that I think is going to be taken up by the Nationals, uh, which actually dug a little and actually found out about how, why it was that 11 people died and, and, and so on. And that, that sort of journalism is going on around the country. Um, we need more of it. 
um, and we need to make sure that it's actually um, uh, put in front of people to read instead of some of the dross that um, we do get instead about babies and so forth. Um, thank you speakers for um, joining us uh, today. Um, we have five minutes left. Hopefully people will come in on YouTube. Um, but before we go, just a word about uh, what we've got coming up next. Um, it's about getting organized and that's what we've been trying to do today. But to do that, you've got to start discussing things and getting together. So the next get together is um, uh, a coffee shop meetup. We're organizing at 10 a.m. every Saturday and that will be on Zoom as opposed to Facebook Live. Hopefully none of you will have the difficulties you may have had today getting onto that. So join us at 10 o'clock on Saturday uh, where we can get down to brass tacks about how we organize in our localities and what they talk about those stories that need to be covered and talking about how we in the media can actually organize um, to defend our, our, our jobs. Um, and the next meeting will be on Monday, uh, next Monday at seven o'clock. Um, and it's going to be with um, the title COVID-19, Journalism, Science and Fiction. And joining us will be Professor John Parrington, who studies cellular and molecular pharmacology at Oxford Uni. Professor Megan Povey, um, who specializes in food science at Leeds University. Charlotte G from MIT Technology Review. And John Lister, uh, a veteran health journalist. So they'll be joining us at seven o'clock next, Monday, the 11th of May. Thank you for tuning in today, everybody. Um, so that's thanks to Granville, Julia, Joanne, and Jack. Thank you very much, people. And um, let's keep the struggle going to speak.